the City of Waterloo, in cooperation with its many active and inspiring entities, presents Heart for the City, a chance to hear and see what's going on in our city and to meet people who serve you, teach you, entertain you, help you, all neighbors and like you. Make this a city on the move. And now, here's our host, the Honorable Quentin Hart. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on Heart for the City. I'm Quentin Hart, proud mayor of Waterloo. There's a lot to cover, so let's get to our first story. Waterloo has over 434 centerline miles of roadway within the city limits. That is like driving from Rock Island, Illinois, and beyond Lincoln, Nebraska. How do we maintain these roads? But almost 30 years ago, voters tied the condition of their roads to the local retail sales. A 1% local option sales tax was approved entirely for street repairs in January 1991. This resulted in more than $215 million raised to resurface and replace crumbling thoroughfares. And there is an incredible road project that is taking place that ties Waterloo and Cedar Falls together. Which road project is that? We'll have that answer in 30 seconds. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Waterloo Regional Airport. Waterloo Regional Airport is served by American Airlines with daily flights to Chicago O'Hare and connections anywhere in the world. Our airport offers convenient and easy access, fast security lines, $6 daily parking, and comfortable passenger waiting areas. Whether you're traveling for business or pleasure, fly ALO. Visit us online to book a flight or to check our flight schedule. Fly with us today. Welcome back to Heart for the City. The City of Waterloo Engineering Department maintains a pavement management system for the city's 431 miles of streets. And to tell us more about one project in process is our own city engineer, Jamie Knudsen. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you. <laughs> have you been here before? I have. The last time I was here, uh, Abram Funches was substituting for you. So. Oh, wow. So you haven't had me yet. I haven't had you no, yet, I'm no. I'm a tough interviewer. So. I hope not. So get ready. All right. <laughs> but uh, Jamie, tell us um, really quickly, how is the engineering department involved in road construction? Well, in this particular project, um, it's not just engineering. Planning, traffic, um, leisure services, we've all worked together to figure out how we want to rebuild this particular road, University Avenue, and it's a collaborative process between us and AECOM, our consultant. It's a back and forth. We tell them what we want, and they'll turn around, do it, and then we'll review it, and it's just a back and forth until we're all happy with what we've got. And so the construction that you can see behind us, well, they, they can see behind <laughs> us, it is behind us, <laughs> but um, is University Avenue. And University Avenue has three phases. So where are we currently at? Well, the first phase was started last year, and that was between Ainsboro and Green Hill. Um, because of the wet weather last fall and this spring, it's held over until this year, and it should be completed by uh, about the end of November here. So that, should, that phase will be done. Phase two is from Green Hill to Midway Drive, mm -hmm. um, and that's the part that's under construction concurrently right now. And then the third phase, which will be let um, in February or so, is from Ainsboro to Highway 63. Right. And uh, speaking of the Green Hill portion of the road, mm -hmm. uh, is that at grade or is that... <laughs> It, <laughs> there was a lot of discussion at, at council about whether or not to put a roundabout in there. Um, a lot of back and forth, a lot of good conversations, but it ultimately was decided to leave the bridge there and uh, like it is and not do the roundabout. It, it was a cost thing. That bridge is in good shape. It was just hard to justify right. that cost. And, and speaking of cost, um, what is, what's the funding structure for University Avenue? And, and how did we even get to the point of, um, well, I'll let you start. But. It, it's, uh, it's mostly being funded through the Iowa DOT. They gave us the road, and they gave us a really big check, as you well know. Um, and that's paying for the biggest chunk of it. But we also have Waterworks is also paying portions to upgrade their infrastructure. The sanitary sewer fund is paying to upgrade some of the sanitary sewer through there. Cedar Falls um, is helping pay for some of the work at the Midway intersection because that's between both cities. As well as the Blackhawk County Gaming Association has given us a large chunk of money for uh, the enhancements. And speaking of enhancements, the citizens um, did not want a road <laughs> that was ugly. And so 
And I use that very because it, it was ugly. Exactly. Um, and and although there's a lot of construction, you may think it looks ugly now, but I think it's actually beautiful because we're starting to bird something and bring something from the ground that's incredible. But um, it, who's working with the aesthetics and uh, the way that it actually looks? Again, as I said, it's a collaborative effort at the beginning with engineering, planning, leisure services, um, AECOMS, uh, has architects on board that take a look at all this stuff. So it's it's really everybody kind of putting their ideas out there, what we think would look good. And obviously we took some cues from Cedar Falls. We want to kind of have a unified corridor throughout both cities. So that's that's where it starts. Right. And um, even throughout this process, um, was there any input from, you know, the people along University Avenue? Oh, absolutely. We've uh, spent a lot of time, uh, especially before construction started, working with the businesses along there, and uh, our consultant, AECOM, does a fabulous job spending time with those businesses. Um, they're able to call and voice any concerns or complaints or, or uh, whatever they need. That way we're able to respond quickly to them. And, you know, beauty comes with the cost. <laughs> beauty does come with the cost, that's for sure. You know, you, we got it for free. Yes, we, yes, we, we did. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was wondering, um, what are some of the costs of uh, the enhancements we're talking about? Well, right, as I mentioned earlier, Blackhawk County Gaming gave the city a grant of $750,000, and we've had to match that with $750,000. So right now the $1.5 million is paying for such things as um, trees, uh, sidewalk, a new new bike trail, um, plantings in the medians, the colored concrete, uh, bus benches and bus stops that haven't been installed yet but will be yet this fall, um, the colored medians, a lot of that stuff to to add some color and some, so it's just not a, a plain concrete road out there. Right, and and you know that's that's good conversations because even prior to. Prior to this, you know, we have a complete streets committee as mm -hmm. well. And you mentioned a couple of those things that they wanted to see, but can you talk about what they what they wanted? Yeah, the the, the, the sidewalk and the bike trail, if you if you recall, there really was no pedestrian accommodations along all of university. Right. So now on the north side, um, from basically Fletcher all the way to Cedar Falls, there will be a sidewalk on the north side of the road. Mm -hmm and there will be a bike trail along the entire length on the south side from Highway 63 all the way to Cedar Falls. We'll have connections to the Green Hill Trail as well as the Highway 63 Trail. Um, and then there will also be some pedestrian access across 63 and providing an on-street bike trail to downtown. Right. And when you, when you talk about the connection between both cities and Fletcher to... Um, uh, mid midway to, to the Cedar Falls border, yes. um, there will not be a roundabout, but will there be a roundabout plan anywhere on University Avenue potentially? There is. We've uh, we looked at the one at Green Hill, obviously, and that one didn't go. But the only other place that really made sense was to put one at Fletcher. Right. Um, those of you that have sat at the Fletcher lights waiting for the lights to change at University I don't like sitting there waiting, so this roundabout's gonna take care of a lot of that. And it was a good fit for that location. The traffic, the location, everything just worked to put it there. Is that, would it be a statue of me there? No, we can no. get one in there, yes, absolutely. <laughs> we can wonder. put one in we'll there. Have the, so. We'll have the folks vote for that. <laughs> yeah, we can, we can certainly look and see if they'll go for that one or not, so. Um, and then, but, but uh, the signalization on University Avenue, how is it unique from other other signals? Well, as, we're, as we've been working on this whole corridor, we're installing fiber optic along the entire length. And what that's going to do is let us synchronize all of the lights along Fletcher, all, or all, along University, excuse me, all the way from one end to the other. Along with that, that's going to let us do what they call adaptive lighting. And it's a, it's a way to plug in a small computer into these street lights, and then you're able to change them as need be. They can be a little dimmer late, late at night, a little brighter earlier in the evening and things like that. It'll help with telling us that this light's out or things like that. So there's some efficiencies and some safety issues that come with that. So to be one of the most significant, um, what was I trying to say? Most... Um, um, it will certainly be our most uh, technologically advanced. Okay. 
stretch of road in in Waterloo, that's and, for sure. And, and in comparative to almost around the state as well, if I'm not mistaken, how did I go from significant to technological? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, but, um, really quick, when can we expect uh, uh, these phases to be done? Well, the current phase, the phase one that started last year, that'll be finished this fall. Phase two, which is from Ainsborough or from Green Hill to Midway, will be... The south half will be done this fall. The north half will be done by the end of next year. And then from Ainsboro to 63, that will be closed completely next year, and that will all be done next year by the end of next year as well. So. And, and we've been doing everything we could to accommodate the businesses. But I, I just want to tell you, Jamie, thank you so much for taking time uh, to tell us about the important upgrade to one of the major arteriers. Art arteriers. I don't know what's going on right now, but please consider <laughs> visiting us again as the University Ab Avenue project nears completion. Uh, but we want to thank you, the engineering department uh, component um, and the experience oversight by many of our different city offices for uh, this major project. So thank you. The decision to consider a roundabout at Fletcher was driven by several factors, including it being added to the Iowa Department of Transportation's top 200 list of dangerous intersections. Fletcher and University ranked 102nd, the third highest ranking of any Waterloo intersection. Original studies of the university corridor show roundabouts would not reduce delays for motorists and would drive up the project costs due to property acquisition. But the Fletcher Interchange, which would not be markedly more expensive to build, was originally studied as a single-lane roundabout. However, with a two-lane roundabout, the delays would actually be less than what they'd be with a traffic signal. So I certainly think this will work out the best for our motorists. Moving on, uh, the, depart the departure of Kevin Dill from the Veteran Affairs Office in Blackhawk County was met with remorse by many. But the shoes are filled, uh, and it is his anchors. It is the anchors away for his replacement. Don't go away. We will meet the new Veteran Affairs Director after this. There's a place that lies directly between where you've been and where you're going. It's the place in the middle, the place where your past and future connect. Hawkeye Community College is that place, connecting you to great faculty, engaged students, and four-year destinations like the University of Northern Iowa. Every masterpiece starts with a blank canvas, and every success story begins with an empty page. Start writing your story today. Hawkeye Community College, connect. Welcome back. A Waterloo native and U.S. Navy veteran has been chosen to lead the Blackhawk County Veteran Affairs Commission. Commi commission members voted unanimously to select Yolando Loveless from among 17 applicants and the County Board of Supervisors unanimously to approve the appointment. So welcome Yolando Loveless to Heart for the City. Welcome, Mayor. All right. Thank nice you for to having see you. Well, well, tell us a little bit um, before we dive into the information. Um, tell us a little bit about your background leading up to this position. Well, um, I'm one of the Lovelaces. There's two of them that are Hall of Famers at East. I'm not that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's my dad and brother. Uh, so I, I chose the military path, and uh, I found my clutch in the military. Um, ended up staying 30 full years of military service and I would do it again. Um, and uh, what's so special about it was I met my better half, or what we call my Eve, my, my wife, Chiquita. And so we've been married 31 years, uh, and then she was in service for 24. So here we are, a, a niche family, able to come back home. Mom and dad still living here in Waterloo. It's good to be back home after 35 years away and to see all the, the great improvements of Waterloo. When you talk about road structures, I had to reacclimate myself with right. Waterloo <laughs> from the time I left in 84 to, to where it is today. So right. thank you for all you've done to the city. Oh, I'm, I'm, I have a great team and great people like you that are moving back to the city as well. And I, I call my wife my better two-thirds, though. <laughs> Gotcha. <laughs> uh, but tell us, um, tell us, uh, you knew Kevin Dill um, before taking this position. Can you tell us about that relationship? Sure. So it was an honor. I was, I was actually uh, doing mail for Waterloo, mm -hmm. and uh, and that job came open. And uh, Kevin 
was able to select me, and it was a great relationship working with Kevin because I learned a lot about. Um, now again, I have a, a military etiquette about myself, mm -hmm. but Kevin had a love that I seen about the compassion and and the drive and and the demeanor of of serving veterans. I'm used to serving them in a military standpoint, but he took it to another level and it allowed me to escalate uh, my leadership and develop the team that I have now. And it was all really based off of Kevin right. establishment. Um, and so, so when, when you talk about uh, your programs, how do you help veterans? So we help them in, in a couple of categories. First, we help them with uh, their compensation, disability, those kind of claims. Additionally, we help them with relief. Um, and then we do a lot of outreach. Um, and because the outreach part is very important for our city. Um, one of the unique things about veterans, some of them come back home and they're scarred, whether it's physically or mentally. And to try to get them out of the four walls of their uh, confines, to get them out and talk to veterans. So our outreach program is probably my number one key is to get veterans out of their confines, come out and speak and talk with each other. And, uh, and what works that I see is when a, a, a veteran can decompress from sitting in the house watching TV or whatever it is, but they come out and they're actually able to, to offload to another veteran, it really relieves a lot of the stress, the anxiety and depression that they have. Right, All right. So um, you mentioned the financial portion, you mentioned uh, the benefits and, and health portion, you mm -hmm. mentioned uh, the ability to be able to have someone to talk to, to walk with them to getting back acclimated. Uh, into the community. Um, also, are there any other services? Is there a partnership with um, uh, for living living places and stuff as well? So Waterloo is great about services, and a lot of like we use um, uh, Operation Threshold, we use um, um, SSDF, and uh, those for HCAP folks. Mm -hmm. And so you know there was a discussion: how many um, homeless veterans do Waterloo have? And until, Mayor, we really don't have a homeless veteran population. Mm -hmm. We have some transit ver veterans that come in from other states and other cities who may not have any means. And so we work with our partners with uh, Operation Threshold, HACAP, and get those veterans housed. And the most unique thing about it is they're able to press a button and get that veteran or that right. family uh, housed within 24 to 48 hours. And so that's something that you would not have seen uh, where I came from Atlanta, Georgia, where I retired. Um, those uh, concentrations of veteran communities like that, it may have been a delay. Right. Here in Waterloo, we're able to service our veterans right away. And Waterloo is considered a, a veteran-friendly veteran friendly community as well. All, yeah, I would say, Mayor, so a lot of our success that we're having from our unfunded programs are all on the back of the kind citizens of Blackhawk right. County. You know, I was fortunate at Hawkeye Community College to work with um, Robin uh, with our Veteran Affairs Program and just seeing, you know, the students coming together and really just formed a great organization and partnership amongst one another for our veterans programs. Um, so I'm very appreciative of all the work and I think recently um, we just adopted a VASH program um, yeah. within our um, Waterloo Housing Authority where mm -hmm. we can help uh, as well from a city level on helping homeless veterans within our community um, as well. But you have a new location uh, right now, or a different location, or revised location, right? Well, I'm smiling because I'm overjoyed, <laughs> yes. Um, the uh, Board of Supervisors was able to uh, give us about 3,500 square foot. It resides right there in the Pinecrest building, um, and we are looking forward to uh, bigger and better things as we look forward to that kicking off here later this, mm -hmm. this month. In fact, we had the pre-contract um, bid meeting, so we got a couple contractors uh, fighting for uh, to do um, some painting and some small minority. I mean, some small construction in that area. Right. Um, but we're looking to do some tape cutting or what we call ribbon cutting, right around January. And of okay. course, you're going to be the invitee <laughs> okay. uh, to come and cut the ribbon for us right. as we celebrate uh, this new space. And and that service that's provided is that just for Waterloo veterans? Well, we, we don't turn down any right. veteran. Um, so by our statute, we're supposed to service uh, Black Hawk County veterans. Right. But any veteran that is in the area and want to participate in a, a veteran community center, please come and uh, enjoy themselves. So there, there's no borders in Black Hawk there, County, no borders whether in Waterloo, Cedar Falls, this is all.
all about our, our county and, and supporting veterans. A veteran is a veteran. Uh, right. So an Iowa veteran is an Iowa veteran. So no matter what county, they can get served by us. And so just uh, lastly, um, are there any other plans in the future or things you're thinking about doing? Well, as you know, coming up, we've just been a busy August. In mm -hmm. fact, yesterday we were out at Hawkeye at their uh, Fall Fest, and we're, we're in, uh, embedded with Hawkeye, UNI, UNIQ, and we like those partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple things we're doing in September, we're doing our second annual, um, uh, what we call Veterans Stand Down, and it's for our disadvantaged veterans to give them uh, some needed tools as we go into right. the winter months, and they get uh, uh, boots, hats, um, They'll, they'll be able to meet with some resource, community resources to get uh, additional help. There'll be job placements. Another big thing that we're doing uh, that we put in place, and I was grateful, is we're doing a blood drive on 9-11 mm -hmm. uh, to commemorate the 9-11. Uh, and so we're doing that in the Pinecrest building. Something new, right. something different, but from the sponsored by the veterans. Uh, and so we're looking to do that. And then, as you know, we're, we're starting to get uh, some donations in from our, our kind citizens. We even had someone donate a piano. Of course, unfortunately, we won't be able to utilize a piano, but we are starting to get some um, uh, weight equipment, mm -hmm. some some Bowflex equipment, some TVs donated, some couches donated. Mm -hmm. So we look forward to that partnership, and and uh, we got so many right now that we we're, we're kind of like trying to prioritize how we're going to utilize this 35 foot square feet of uh, space because it's going to be packed with uh, donations. Well, if you need any uh, strength and conditioning, you can always call on the mayor and I can come help, help hey. show y'all how to do it a little bit. Well, we'll, we'll use you as, a, as, a, as an a example what? of <laughs> that, pure health, so <laughs> say. All yes, right. sir. Well, uh, first, as always, on behalf of our citizens, I want to thank you for your service and the service you continue to provide on, the, on behalf of our veterans. So thank you also for taking time to update us on this exciting future in store for over 7,000 veterans and their families in the Cedar Valley. Blackout County leaders totally support plan, plans for the new Veterans Center in the Pinecrest building. The Veterans Center was the brainchild of former VA director Kevin Deal and is expected to provide a space for veterans to gather, but will include areas for fitness classes, presentations, counseling, meals, and recreation. And to quote Yolando, now we can dream big and do some things to improve the lives of veterans and their spouses and families. If you have items to help furnish the new center, please call the Veterans Administration Administrative Office at 319-291-2512 or email yloveless at co.black-hawk.ia.us. <laughs> so, all right, moving on. I have always advocated uh, the preeminent importance of our youth, and the role of, of the youth is simply to renew, refresh, and maintain status of our society, including leadership, innovations, and skills. Youth are expected to advance the current technology, education, politics, and peace of the country, but they must be prepared, feel safe, and acquire a sense of self-confidence. In Waterloo, we have a number of organizations that help you to adjust to this often complex society. One organization envisions, envisions the possibility that all youth are able to achieve their full potential. What organization has this vision? Stay with us. The answer after this. Getting healthy has never been easier with a membership at Cedar Valley Sportsplex. Offering 80 free classes a week at all skill levels, there's always new and fun opportunities to grow. You never have to miss out on your favorites with our state-of-the-art facilities, featuring great exercise equipment, a track and field, pool, and two regulation gyms. So whether your game is football or pickleball, let the Cedar Valley Sportsplex turn your routine into something amazing. We are privileged to have so many dedicated people working for the benefit of you. In March, we were blessed to have a new executive director for the Big Brothers, Big Sisters organization, a person who has dedicated her life to advocacy for you and to bring insight to the many cultural factors affecting our most vulnerable citizens. Her powerful and positive messaging exudes a deep commitment to you and community and will make her a wonderful new leader in the Cedar Valley. I am pleased to welcome Yolanda Williams. I'm sorry, 
Miss Yo. <laughs> so how are you? I'm fantastic. First of all, thank you for having me today. It's such a great opportunity and an honor. Well, we appreciate you being here. And just by our introduction, that's uh, some pretty huge shoes to fill. But before we start talking more about the organization, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up as executive director? Absolutely. So um, as you said earlier, I've spent a lifetime dedicated to young people. Um, and really for me, it was about me being the person that I needed as a young person. So just coming from a very dysfunctional and challenging background, um, I've lived it. And once I became a mother, it was very important for me to make sure that not only my children, but other children around me have those great opportunities to be successful and have positive mentors in their life so that they could achieve their full um, potential. Right. Um, and so really have spent 27 years in Omaha advocating for young people um, in the elected official circuit as well a little bit, but it was time for me to grow. Um, and this fabulous opportunity popped up here in Waterloo, which had never been here before. So um, coming here blind, it's been such a great honor to just jump in with both feet and head first at the same time into this community and really advocate for youth. And you really embrace that. I mean, everywhere I go, <laughs> I see you somewhere. I see you talking to people, talking to young people, just, uh, just embracing the moment. So uh, we appreciate that. And the reason you're here almost sounds like a mission statement that could be used, but what is the mission statement for the Big Brothers and Big Sisters? So our mission statement is to create and support one-to-one -one mentoring relationships that that ignite the power and promise of youth. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually is a newer, we've really just tweaked that at the national office, and so that's just something that the entire network um, lives, breathes, and really li uh, just works every day to make sure that that's happening. And it, it, you said you, want, you wanted to model what you, you believe that you needed when you were growing up. So Absolutely. how does the mentoring program, how does it even work? So um, there's, there's an entire process. So one, I want to back up a little bit and say that there is a service delivery model um, that each match is required to follow with uh, professionally supported match specialists, starting from inquiry all the way through closure of the process. Um, there's, I mean, child safety is obviously the number one priority for us, making right. sure that, you know, those mentors that are interested in changing the life of a young person they have the appropriate background screenings and the checks. Um, but we really go through a very rigorous process of ensuring that there's a great match, that there's, uh, the, the, the children are safe, um, and we've, we've made a, a successful and long-lasting match um, for our young people in the program. Um, and they are supported, again, professionally at every step of the way by our staff who have uh, social work backgrounds. They go through intense training. Um, locally as well as through the national office. Um, and so that's kind of our process. Right. Um, but it starts with an inquiry from a big and an inquiry from a little. And, and how, many, how many young people are involved in the program or what are, what are your goals? So currently we um, have served 350 young people year to date. Our goal is 400. So we've got a few months left to get those 400 matches created and made. I'm so very excited to keep pushing to, towards our goal. And we know the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. Um, so how can the community participate and help, help this process? So there's three ways that we are looking for the community to participate. We need mentors, we need funding, and we need your presence at our events. Um, so we have an event coming up on October 25th. It's our Masquerade Big Casino Night. You can find more information on our website at www.iowabigs.org. And, and also, um, and that's the individual uh, perspective, but uh, how do you partner with schools and nonprofits and organizations and the community as a whole as well? That is an amazing question. Um, that is something, as you know, that when I came into this agency, there was collaboration, but not at the level that I believe that this agency could create. Um, and so we've worked very hard to build those relationships with partnering uh, nonprofits and other agencies in the area. Um, as you know, we just had our first annual Cedar, I have to say it right, it's kind of a long title. So <laughs> first annual Cedar Valley Community Partner Back to School event. Mm -hmm. um, and we were blessed to have about six partners come out. We all pitched in to really create a free, family-friendly 
um, event for all ages. We had over 240 participants come out. And so that's just one of the many ways that we're looking to collaborate. And then the next level of this for me is to also look at what areas do we all cover um, geographically and where are the gaps and how do we utilize each other's resources and skill sets to make sure that our families have a very holistic approach to being prepared for their future. And right now, uh, how many youth right now need a mentor? We currently have 137 littles ready to be matched. We have 80 little brothers and I had to check my notes really quick, 57 little sisters. Um, so we definitely need the communities to continue to rally and support these young people and their families in this community. And what ages, what are the ages of the youth in the program? Starting at age five all the way up to age 18. And is there a cost to the parents or to the mentor? There is no cost to our families or our mentor. This is a free program for our community. We just want you to show up and really make a difference in the life of a young person, which ultimately affects their family life um, and generational change by being a mentor. So, and, and how are you funded? So we are. Uh, we do a lot of things to like be the funded. Speed round. Yeah, this is the speed <laughs> round. So grants. We do fundraisers and individual and corporate donors. Okay. And are families involved as well in the program? So there is a requirement for community-based mm -hmm. um, that you have that families have to be engaged, but we invite all of our families, regardless of what program aspect you're in, to be a part of this agency. Mm -hmm. And how does one get to be to be a volunteer? What what is the process? So the process starts by going to the website and filling out the inquiry, whether that's the big or the little, and from there the staff follows up and walks you through every detailed pro um, portion of the process. Right, and this question is kind of a big question, um, but when we talk about um, holistic, holistic um, development, uh, what, is, what is meant by that? So when I say holistic development, I really look at we are one community and we all have a part to play in this, whether it's health, mental health, whether it's mentoring, whatever that looks like, we are supposed to be partnering together, and that's a big piece of the collaboration that I'm bringing. All right. Well, uh, you know, I just want to say it's been a pleasure uh, meeting you, working with you, uh, seeing your heart and passion for uh, the youth in our community, just uh, for the city of Waterloo overall and the area that you serve. So I want to thank you and Yolanda for the time and service you expend working for the betterment of our young people. And about a year ago, Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Northeast Iowa celebrated its 55th anniversary in the Cedar Valley. And I was at a luncheon which celebrated and thanked all of the agencies, uh, program champions. Among others, I was able to share from my experience kind words about the powerful work of the Big Brothers and Big Sisters. Uh, I and so many others appreciate the strong work uh, that you are doing and all those that you work with and everyone throughout the community uh, that's working to make this one of the greatest organizations we can possibly have in our community. So thanks again. Mary Jane McLeod Bethune was an American educator, stateswoman, philanthropist, humanitarian, and civil rights activist best known for starting a private school for African American students. And let me quote her, we have a powerful potential in our youth and we, we must have the courage to change old ideas and practices so that we may direct their power toward good ends. For more information about how you can make a difference in a child's life and become a volunteer or donate to Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Northeast Iowa, please visit www.iowabigs.org or contact the office in Blackhawk County at 319-235-9397. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Looking for something to do? 
for entertainment, shopping, eating, and more. Go to experiencewaterloo.com for, compl for complete listings of so many exciting activities, places, and venues. A reminder, the Waterloo Urban Farmers Market is located outdoors at the Riverloop Expo at 460 Jefferson Street in Waterloo. The market is open 8 a.m. to noon on Saturdays until October 26. And almost any kind of farm produce can be found there as well as such items as eggs, honey, arts, uh, crafts, including jewelry, scented soaps and wood, crafts, potteries essential oils and fresh hours to name a few and live music as well. So be sure to check out the Main Street website and that's www.mainstreetwaterloo.org. We have much more going on in downtown Waterloo including an exciting annual events which you want, won't want to miss. And consider the many opportunities to be a part of Main Street by volunteering. Well, that's our show, and we welcome your suggestions and feedback. And remember to tell others that these episodes are available for viewing from the City of Waterloo website and at cityofwaterlooiowa.com and search for Heart for the City. And be sure to like us on Facebook. And please join us next time, and thanks for watching Heart for the City. Until then, I think you will agree, it's a great day to be in Waterloo.